Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. This is Jody Patterson, Director of Client Development for Oasis Solutions. Thank you again for joining us for our presentation on Sales Tax Nexus 101, presented by our partners over at Avlera. To do some brief introductions, um, or before we get into introductions, I do want to let you know that we will be recording the webinar today, and we can send that to you, uh, the recording, so that you can share amongst your colleagues after the we wrap the webinar. We also encourage questions, although you will be muted throughout the course of the webinar today, please put your questions into the Q&A window, and we will answer those as we go along instead of waiting for the very end. So just pop them in there, and I will monitor those as we go along. So uh, jumping into introduction. Again, my name is Jody Patterson. I am with Oasis Solutions as Director of Client Development. And we have our partners from Avlera on the line, Alexandra Lyons. And we also have George Padilla, although he is uh, impostering himself as Alex Lyons today. George, you might want to change your name there. Um, <laughs> Alex Lyons and Keith Saka are both uh, sales executives with Avlera, and they are going to be the presenters discussing Sales Tax Nexus 101 for us today. Um, for those of you, know, we, we have a good mix today on the line. We've got uh, some current customers, some current Avlera customers, as well as some um, other individuals that are, are not yet affiliated with Oasis Solutions or Avlara. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Before we get started, just a little bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with Oasis Solutions. We are a Sage 100 and NetSuite partner. We were founded in 1991. Uh, so we have 30 years of experience and there are some of our uh, incredible logos um, or achievements. We uh, were just recently awarded a, a Fast 50 company here in the Louisville, Kentucky area. And we've been a best places to work in Louisville and Kentucky for the past three or four years running. Uh, Solana, I might need you to uh, update me on that one. I've lost track of how often we've won that award. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> we are regionally based in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, the vast majority of our clients are in uh, Kentucky, Nashville, um, Indiana, Tennessee, North Carolina area, kind of regionally based, but we do span across the U.S. in over uh, 36 states. At Oasis, uh, we focus on people and our processes because we do believe that who you buy from is more important than what you buy. And who you were working with when you work with Oasis Solutions are consultants who are CPAs, MBAs, former CFOs, controllers, and software developers. So we don't just know software, we know your job on your side of the desk. Our project managers have over 350 years of combined expertise. And now moving on to Avlera. Alex, over to you. Thanks, Jody. And thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, we have a really exciting topic today. I'm sure everyone is really thrilled to be talking about sales tax. Um, really, um, today's com uh, webinar, I wouldn't even say it's a webinar. I want this to just be kind of informational. I'd really, really encourage any questions that anyone might have. Um, pop those into the chat because we love to answer questions and this it can be a very confusing topic. Um, kind of the three big things that we want to cover today um, between myself and Keith um, is Sales Tax Nexus 101, which is obviously the title of the webinar, but we're going to kind of drill that into just talking about a lot of the changes that have happened uh, in the sales tax world over the last few years um, and talk about how that's impacting the customers that we work with every day, um, how it might be impacting you guys, talk about some of the challenges that we see customers facing. Um, I personally have been here at Avalara working um, on the Sage team for about four years. So I have a lot of experience working and help working with and helping customers navigate um, compliance issues as well as getting set up um, from an automation standpoint when it comes to sales tax. So I can definitely speak to some of the challenges that I'm seeing customers that might be similar to you guys um, and, and what they're facing. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we can kind of talk about, you know, if any of the things that we're bringing up today are sort of sparking a question in your mind or, you know, maybe scaring you even a little bit, we can talk about, you know, what sort of steps you would need to take to, to figure some of this out. So, um, 
please, please, please answer or send any questions over so we can answer those as we go. Um, the first thing I kind of want to just address for anyone that may not know um, what the word nexus actually means. I always want to just address that. So the word nexus uh, is just basically meaning a company's obligation to collect and remit sales tax to a state. So, you know, most of you, I'm sure, are registered uh, for sales tax probably in your home state. And you might be filing a sales tax return maybe monthly, maybe annually, quarterly. Um, and some of you may not necessarily be dealing with traditional sales tax. You may not be selling to end users and actually charging sales tax, but you are still reporting on your sales through that sales tax registration. Um, so we're going to definitely talk about, you know, both sides of the fence, how this stuff is impacting companies that are selling to end users, as well as companies that might be selling, um, you know, to, through distribution networks, or maybe you're a manufacturer, or maybe you're selling everything to the other businesses. Um, and your stuff is not generally taxable. So we'll talk about all of that. Um, but overall, Nexus has really gotten a lot more complex. Um, it has been getting more complex over the last five to 10 years, and it got really even more complex back in 2018 um, with something that you guys may have heard of called the Wayfair ruling, which we're going to talk a little bit more about. Um, but there are two ways that you can create Nexus. Um, so there's economic Nexus, which basically affects any business that is selling across state lines and shipping into another state. Um, so whether or not you have physical nexus or physical presence doesn't matter. If you are shipping into another state, you could potentially be affected by economic nexus. Physical nexus does obviously allude to where your company has physical presence, um, but that's not as simple as it sounds. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, the rules for sales tax are changing constantly. Um, during 2018 and 2019, it was like a month to month thing um, in terms of what sort of changes were coming down and it was impossible for people to keep up with it. Um, the, the changes have slowed down a bit, but there are still so many different pieces of sales tax compliance that are being updated, um, you know, either annually, sometimes the rates are changing monthly. So there's a lot that's changing and it's very, very difficult um, for anybody to keep up with, especially, you know, smaller businesses that maybe don't have an actual tax department. And along with all of that, the compliance costs are increasing. You know, I talk to people every day who say that they might be spending, you know, days out of their month just dealing with sales tax. Obviously, that's very expensive for companies to be paying, you know, their employees to deal with something that's not generating revenue. So it's a very expensive expensive thing to keep up with um, for most of the businesses that we work with. So we just want to talk about some of those alternatives and, and kind of how we can help with that, you know, as we go through this deck. Unfortunately, compliance is also not optional. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time who have sort of buried their head in the sand over the last few years and not really kept up with all of these changes that have been coming up down the pipe and what's starting to happen. Um, especially in the COVID world that we live in now, or that states are struggling, they're losing money, so they're starting to target people. Um, so they're, they're sending out letters to companies. If you get a letter from a state, at that point, you're sort of, you know, at their disposal in terms of what you may or may not owe. We'll talk a little bit more about kind of what happens when that happens in, as, as we go along as well. But, um, you know, if you do have a nexus in a state, the burden of that is on you as a company. Um, and so, you know, the risk is that you could get audited, the risk that you could have to pay a ton of money in terms of not only back taxes, but also penalties and interest. Things can get very expensive if you are not in compliance. Um, so the goal is to figure out how to get into compliance before uh, an audit happens. Um, and so, that's a big part of what this discussion today is to talk about, you know, are there any things that you might be missing the mark on? And if so, how can you fix it? Yep. And uh, this is Keith here with Avalara. Uh, just some background by myself. I've been with the company for just over six years now, and I directly support our NetSuite team. Uh, so probably the biggest question you have in mind right now is why now? Why, why do you need to think about compliance now? And there's actually quite a few reasons why. And uh, We'll start with the states. So from the state perspective, the states are needier, they are greedier. So there's actually the vast majority of states in the US, there's a total budget deficit of about $55 billion. And the low hanging fruit there is sales tax. 
sales tax accounts for about 50% of state tax revenues. Now, this has been exacerbated by government budget cuts, tax cuts, but also, as you can imagine, within the past couple of years, COVID. Um, COVID has left some of these uh, left some of these states actually starving for tax revenue because a lot of businesses have been uh, not doing as well as they had in previous years. So we've noticed, especially in this industry, that some of the states have been getting uh, a little bit more aggressive when it comes to sales tax. Uh, I've identified probably three states that I've come across quite often, one being California, where I'm from. Uh, California has been sending out quite a few notices to a lot of my customers, actually, just asking general questions um, you know, about their business to see if they should be collecting tax in California. Uh, another notice out there is Washington. Washington has actually sent a bill to my customers. Uh, one of them received a bill for about $25,000 from Washington saying, hey, you know, we know you do a lot of business in our state. You should be collecting tax here. Um, here's a bill for $25,000. Pay this, register, and move forward. So they talked to their tax attorney. Their tax attorney said, yep, you're getting off rather light. You probably owe them a lot more than that. So they paid it. They registered. They moved forward, started collecting tax. And of course, Washington came back uh, a little bit later and said, hey, here's another bill for twenty-five grand. Uh, you also need to pay this as well. That's when they actually fought back and they, uh, you know, argued against it. Uh, so Pennsylvania has been the last state that I've noticed has been pretty aggressive with this. They've sent out notices to some of my customers. And unfortunately, if you get a notice from a state, um, Avalara can't help you in terms of getting some of that past exposure cleaned up because the states have already reached out to you. Now, from the actual business perspective, something that a lot of businesses need to keep in mind are any changes to the business that you know, might impact your sales tax. So one of the common ones I see is mergers and acquisitions. Actually, one of the clients I'm working with right now, they just acquired a company out here in California, and it's really impacted their sales tax. And one of their fears is they just don't want to do sales tax in California because they've heard it's really complicated. Uh, states like Kentucky, it's probably rather simple. I think you have one state rate, but here in California, we have roughly about 350 to 400 jurisdictions all charging different rates. So it's just really hard to keep track of. Okay, next slide. So some of the things that have been triggering Nexus in the past, as Alex had mentioned, physical Nexus was the largest and basically the only Nexus trigger. You have an office in California, you have your business in California, you only need to collect tax in California, even if you sold to other states. But as I mentioned, with the deficit that states are facing, they've looked for more ways to, and not really entice, but actually get businesses to start collecting tax in their state because they're losing out on billions of dollars in tax revenue due to e-commerce. And one of the biggest ones recently, as she had mentioned, is economic nexus, the wafer versus South Dakota rolling. But also there's all these different nexus triggers that can affect your business and are reasons why you should start collecting tax in other states. So as you can see here, affiliate marketing. So if you have any affiliate partners that you're, you're selling through or marketing through, that can be a nexus trigger. One of the big ones that we've seen is drop shipments, um, but also you know, hiring field sales reps. So um, in COVID, a lot of businesses, including Avalara, started hiring remote employees. And so I've been dealing with a lot of clients lately that have hired remote employees in other states. And as a result, they have to start collecting tax in other states. So it's been a really huge burden for them just to manage sales tax in multiple states. And to kind of echo, so a lot of the stuff on the previous slide was related to like physical things. So if you're, you know, physically traveling to another state for a trade show or you have employees that are working in other states or you're storing inventory, maybe in other states, those are all things that the states look at as physical triggers. And those things have been in place for much longer than the Wayfair ruling, which happened in June of 2018. So you know, if, if any of those things are happening, it's definitely worth um, taking a closer look at just to make sure that you're not in a situation where you have nexus that you don't know about. Um, and so to kind of move into economic nexus a little bit more, um, that is where that South Dakota versus Wayfair ruling comes into play. So that, that Supreme Court case happened, uh, or the ruling happened in June of 2018. So, you know, we are about three years, a little over three years past that at this point. 
Um, unfortunately, a lot of the customers I am talking to day to day are still in a position where they haven't really ever done any sort of formal evaluation of whether or not this is impacting them. Um, so if you haven't and you are selling remotely, I, I would highly you know, recommend that that be something that's considered. Um, the way the economic thresholds work um, is just like all things sales tax, they were not made to be simple. Every single state sort of set their own threshold as what they deem as a business selling something substantial into their state. Um, so there's a few examples listed here on the right of the screen. So, you know, a lot of the states might have set a threshold that's just like $100,000 in taxable sales, meaning if $100,000, if you're exceeding $100,000 in sales that are sold directly to a consumer, then you can create economic nexus. Other states, like California and Texas, they have a higher threshold, $500,000, but they're looking at gross sales. So if you're exceeding $500,000 in those two states, um, it doesn't matter if it's to a manufacturer, to a distributor, if it's exempt for whatever reason, if you are exceeding that $500,000 limit, they do want you to be registered in their state and reporting. Um, and then other states also target uh, gross sales, most of them actually do. So that's a really common misconception about the Wayfair ruling is it does not just impact people who are selling retail sales or online e-commerce sales. If you are selling across state lines, most of the states actually look at gross sales at, in terms of their threshold. Um, some of them look at dollar amounts. You can see Georgia has $100,000 in sales, but they also look at transactional limits. So 200 transactions. Um, so if you are only selling, you know, $25,000, but you are sold 250 separate transactions, then Georgia would look at you as needing to be registered in their state for economic nexus. So there's so many different factors to look at. It's very complicated. Um, we can definitely provide you with resources for anyone who would like them um, on the breakout for each individual state. Um, but this has been in play now since 2018, and it is very important um, to evaluate it if you haven't. Um, so, you know, Keith talked a little bit about this. I can kind of speak to what I see most in my space in the stage world, you know, common triggers that are either creating physical or economic nexus. Um, E-commerce growth is a huge one. With COVID happening, so many of my customers have decided to start selling online. Uh, and the thing about selling online when it comes to economic nexus is it may be everything you've been selling up until this point has been for resale or has been exempt for some reason. Uh, but now you're getting ready to launch an e-commerce site. It is very important to have a conversation around nexus before you launch an e-commerce site so that day one when you launch that website, you're not going immediately into creating tax liability. So if you've had physical nexus in a state for two years and you didn't maybe know it, it's important to know that before you launch an e-commerce site so that when you launch the website, when you start selling, if you sell someone in that state, that it wouldn't be viewed as tax liability. Um, so you really, really, before doing something like doing, launching an e-commerce site, need to make sure you're registered in the right places so that you can calculate tax where necessary and make sure you're filing and reporting on that. So that's something I see a lot. Um, like he said, with mergers, you know, changes in ownership, things like that are can definitely impact Nexus as well. Um, you know, as you expand into more states, start over their locations. I know, like he said, with COVID, you've got you know more people who are able to work remotely, so they might be working in another state. Um, so anything that has changed, um, you know, in terms of how you guys operate, it it could potentially affect Nexus, and it's always really important to kind of ask yourself that question. Um, before, or to may ask the question, have a conversation around Nexus before you sort of like proceed into a new state. Okay. So one of, one of the common actually responses that I get from a lot of my customers is, hey, we're a manufacturer. Um, these kind of laws around sales tax don't impact us. Unfortunately, if you're a manufacturer, you're not off the hook completely. And Alex, I think there's a, still a little bit more verbiage on here. If you click. Yep, there you go. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Unfortunately, if you're a manufacturer, you're not off the hook. Um, the way that Wayfair versus South Dakota and Economic Nexus have impacted manufacturers is, as Alex had mentioned, most states are gross space when it comes to these thresholds. So just because you're selling 
ex to exempt customers to resellers doesn't mean that you're not triggering nexus in, in additional states. And the burden for this is if you do trigger nexus in additional states, you still have that requirement to manage those exempt certificates. So one of my customers I worked with last year, a good example of this is they were only in a couple states. Um, I think they're in about three states. And then they did a nexus analysis after uh, Wafer versus South Dakota and found out that they had to collect tax in just about every single state. So the requirement for them went from managing, you know, a couple hundred exemption certificates to and managing probably about 10,000. So with them, the burden was, first of all, reaching out to their customers in these states that they worked with for years and telling them, hey, we need to collect an exemption certificate from you and, um, you know, managing those exemption certificates going forward. Now, when it comes to those certificates, unfortunately, if you do get audited, that's one of the first things they look for is the exemption certificates because if you don't have the certificates on file, then you could be on the hook in line for all that sales tax. So there's two things that we've actually noticed during audits is one, exemption certificates, and two, use tax. Now, when it comes to managing those exemption certificates, there's quite a few headaches there. Um, you know, making sure you have the right certificate, getting it from customers, and then managing going forward. Next slide. So, you know, Keith just kind of alluded to this. These are just some examples. Um, you know, these are not my customers. I can speak more specifically to, to examples I've seen with my own customers. But in a nutshell, you know, if you are in a position where you're not selling anything direct to consumer, um, but you are selling across state lines, if you do find that you have economic nexus in state, the, the, the burden that is created of having to collect and manage multiple uh, exemption documents across states is huge. Um, if you are selling to like larger uh, companies, you know, a lot of my customers sell to like Home Depot or Lowe's, um, you know, you do have to manage an exemption document typically for every state that that customer is in. Um, every state has different rules around when those documents expire, um, you know, how long they're, they're valid, whether it be because of uh, the reason that they're exempt. So I know like, for example, Florida, their resale documents expire every year, um, but then it might be a different rule for if it's a government entity or nonprofit. So there's lots to keep up with. And so if you are in a position where you create a nexus in a state, but nothing is necessarily taxable, while yeah, you don't have to collect sales tax, you do have to start managing documents in those states to back up the sales. Um, otherwise, if a state were to come knocking, they would view what you've been selling as tax liability. Um, so it's very, very important that if you do create nexus in another state, regardless of whether or not what you're selling is taxable, that you are uh, properly managing the exemption document. Oh gosh, exemption documents that those customers um, should be providing you with. And again, hey, I get. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Alex, did you see that we have a question? I did not. Okay, it looks like Michael had one um, here along those lines. It was, if a business is hit with a tax bill from a state, is that business entitled to apply credit to the state sales tax return, which the transaction was originally reported in? Trying to digest that question. I'm pulling it up to read it, too. And Keith, Absolutely. you want to read it? Yeah. So. I guess I'm a tiny bit confused. So if, is this, uh, and Michael, I don't know if you're able to come into the chat and clarify, are you, is this asking like if you were to get a letter from a state that you're not registered in, or is this if you get a bill from a state that you're already registered in? This would be my question. already registered. Okay, so if you're already registered and you get a tax bill from a state, then I, Keith, back me up here, but I believe you would just have to, to pay that um, because most of what we're talking about here is speaking and alluding to if you are not registered in a state. Um, if you're not registered in a state and you're in a situation where there's been unreported tax, for example, there are options for handling that. Whereas if you're already registered in the state and you're getting a bill because maybe something was filed incorrectly, 
uh, unfortunately, in most cases, you do have to pay that. Um, Keith, do you have anything that you would add to that? No, that sounds correct. Um, <laughs> that's that's another reason why, you know, if you're in a situation where you are questioning whether or not you're registered in the right places, it's always good to have a conversation with like Avalara um, or, you know, a tax attorney to find out if there's anything that you might be missing because as long as you're not registered with the state or as long as the state has not contacted you, you do have the luxury of sort of taking your time to figure out what might be owed and you do also have options in that regard, which I'll talk about um, a little bit more here in the next couple slides too. Um, whereas if you are registered in a state or if the state sends you a letter, which Keith and I see that all the time, I'm personally dealing with a couple of customers that have received letters from California. If that has happened, unfortunately, you're kind of at their disposal. Um, so there's not a lot that can be done once they have reached out. Uh, and Michael, I see that you added, you said, if I reported a sale in Kentucky, but I received a bill from Tennessee, I got gotcha. you. Would I be able to apply a credit with Kentucky for that state? The answer to that question is yes, but it's also a little bit complicated. Um, I would encourage you, uh, Michael, um, please get with us after this call because we can talk a little bit more about how to handle that. Um, we have a part of our organization that can assist with recovery services. So if you have reported sales to the wrong state, what you would need to do is actually um, go through a recovery process to get that back from the state that you filed it incorrectly with so that you can can actually do what you're saying. So we can talk about that. Please uh, definitely reach out to one of us and we can help you a little bit more with that. Um, getting back to the slide that we're on right now. So I get questions a lot about documents. I had someone forward me a document last week that was a DMV form and they said, is this an exemption document? And some customer had sent this to one of my customers. And I'm like, no, that's not an exemption form. So it's definitely something that gets really complicated. You know, when you're asking customers to provide you with an exemption certificate, a lot of times you're going to have people sending you the wrong thing. They don't know necessarily what you're asking for. Um, so it's a really convoluted process. Um, and so we do have services um, as well as an automation tool that helps manage this, this, uh, this process that we can talk a little bit more about if anybody has questions after this. But it's definitely something that, again, to kind of go back to what he said at the beginning of the exemption conversation, just because you're not selling taxable sale, taxable products does not necessarily mean you're not impacted by, the, by this conversation or by the nexus changes that have happened. Actually, funny, going back to the uh, which form you need to collect, I remember my old manager here, he had a story about when he was a sales guy and um, the accounting department asked him to go out and get an exemption certificate from his customer. They gave him something that was looked like an exemption. He had no clue what it was. He sent it to his accounting department and they said, this is not what we're looking for. This is, has to do with an agricultural exemption, has nothing to do with sales tax. Um, so it's, it's funny. He always reminded me of that story because a lot of the people who are collecting these certificates, you know, they might be customer service reps. They might be salespeople they have no clue what an exemption certificate is. Um, so they'll just ask for whatever from a customer and what form they get back, they'll submit it and usually it's incorrect. So it's, um, I just remember that story every time I come across this. When it comes to the burden of registering more states, uh, one of the biggest burdens there is not only from collecting sales tax, but also just remitting to the states. So when it comes to, you know, met, reg, uh, registering in, you know, 20, 30 additional states, you have to get your filing calendars, you have to manage those filing calendars. Some states, you might be monthly, some states, you might be quarterly, some states, you might be annual. Uh, California, for instance, it's typically monthly with a quarter prepayment. Um, you have to aggregate all that data together. So one of the exercises that our solutions consultants team put us through when we were um, first started here at Avalara is they actually gave us a report from um, an ERP system, I think was Microsoft, and it was just a data dump of all these numbers. And they said, hey, this is what your customers get. Um, go ahead and fill out the California tax return. And so they left us with this exercise. I remember staring at that thing for about three or four hours before I finally just gave up. I talked with a lot of customers who do the California tax return. 99% of them say it's difficult, it's a challenge, it's time consuming. 
there's 1% that say it's easy, I would gamble that that 1% is doing it incorrectly because it's not easy. Um, responding to notices. So California, again, is, is, is one of these states that sends out a lot of notices, questions about things you file. So it's just something that, you know, you have to be on top of this or you can get in trouble with the states. And then just spending time. Um, you can go from a couple of days of, or a day filing sales tax in a couple states to filing in 30 or 40 states. Um, one of our customers, we had a customer, a CFO panel, I think it was about a year or two ago at our sales kickoff. And one of the CFOs, he's told us, he said, hey, I went from spending uh, uh, maybe a couple hours a month for a handful of states to spending, you know, maybe a couple hours a month for 40 states, you know, and he said the the uh, time that he's, he saved with a solution like App Valera um, was paid for itself because he anticipated that he'd be spending probably at least a week or more filing returns in these states if he didn't have a solution in place. So we have talked a lot about problems um, and challenges that we're seeing people face, but we haven't talked a lot about how to handle the situation if these are things that might be impacting you. So um, before I kind of talk about like, how to go about looking into this, should you need to, um, we are going to launch a poll here very quickly. Um, and then we'll move into talking about um, what to do if any of this has brought up a question for you. Okay, so um, you should be seeing the poll on your screen now. So where do you feel your organization falls currently from a sales tax compliance standpoint? A, I'm in trouble. B, sweating a little bit. We may have some room for improvement. Or C, we would ace an audit. There we go. I'm hoping that you all can see that. I opened that up a little bit. Improvement was running off my screen. Hopefully it wasn't your all's. Okay, it looks like we are at about 61% right now. I'll wait for um, a few minutes here. Maybe not quite a few minutes. Let's go a few seconds because we're right about 76%. I haven't introduced myself either. This um, is Alana Callahan. I'm Oasis Solutions Marketing Manager, poll launcher extraordinaire today, and we're at about 84%. So let's wait just a little bit longer in case anyone else wants to chime in here. Okay, I think that that is good. I'm gonna go ahead and end this and then I will share the results so everyone can see. I'm glad, I appreciate the honesty here, everyone. <laughs> it looks like there's a lot of people that maybe have some questions, which um, we can definitely talk about how to, how to fix things if you are worried, um, but I do appreciate the honesty for sure. On, I guess we can move to the next question. I think there were two. Absolutely. There we go. Poll number two. I'm going to go ahead and launch that. If you do feel that you need help, what areas are most concerning? And I'm going to let you all read through those yourselves. I'm gonna give it a little bit longer here. We're at about 76% in case anyone else wants to answer. Always like that, I have no idea. I am so confused. So I definitely am on some of these questions sometimes. Nice that it's an option. <laughs> okay, I think that we are safe to end this poll. 
and I can share. It does look like there's a wide range of concerns. So, um, I, you know, I'm going to go through. Um, this is our last slide. I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what I typically see most groups that have questions about any of this, where they start. Um, however, regardless, if you if you have any questions at all, um, you know, please, 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 Jody's going to send out a follow up email after this today. Um, we would love to have a call um, with anyone that has questions. Um, you know, we we try very hard here at Avalara to work consultatively with our customers. We want to make sure that we are answering your questions. We have so many resources internally. We have a tax research side of the house. We have a tax advisory side of the house. We have all sorts of resources that we can connect you with to answer questions and make sure that you guys are, you know, in a situation where you feel confident. So um, regardless of, you know, how you want to proceed, please uh, let us know if we can um, provide you with any resources to help answer some of these questions. But um, I think at this point, let's talk about kind of, you know, if if any of this are questions, which it sounds like a lot of you, this is um, a little bit concerning. Um, how how can you handle this? Um, what is your first step? Because it is a very overwhelming topic, and we are very aware of that. And I will say, you know, one of my biggest jobs here at Avalara is helping companies that are in a situation where they have questions, helping them navigate that. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is through a service um, called a sales tax risk assessment. Essentially, what the risk assessment is, um, it is a questionnaire that if you do want to um, go through this process, it is an online questionnaire that we would give you access to through an online portal. What that questionnaire does is it will take you through, um, for every state, have you answer questions about your business activities in each state. So it's going to cover anything that could potentially trigger a physical nexus in a state. It's also going to cover economic nexus. So it's going to ask some questions around your sales volumes by year so that we can do a full analysis of where you actually have nexus today. Um, so what's really important is once that questionnaire has been submitted, what we will provide to you is a very detailed report explaining to you exactly where you have nexus where you might, in terms of like where you're not registered today, where you do have nexus and are not reporting. Um, and we also give you a reason for that. So the reason is going to be a very important piece of it because it tells you is it economic nexus, is it physical nexus, and that gives you insight into how long that's been potentially going on. Um, so if it is physical nexus and you've had an employee that's been working in another state for five years and you didn't necessarily know that that was a physical nexus trigger, it's important to know that so that we can then help you to evaluate if there might be any exposure in those states. So the first step is evaluating where do you actually have Nexus that you're not registered. And then after we have that comprehensive list, what we will do is help you to evaluate your exposure. Um, so we have steps that will help you take to, to figure out how much have you been selling into those states over the course of time or the period of time that you've had Nexus so that we can help you understand if there is any potential exposure. The good news for a lot of companies that are primarily selling to people who are exempt is that while it may look like you have tax exposure, you may not necessarily have tax exposure if you do have exemption documents to back up what you've been selling. Um, the other thing I see with a lot of my customers is they don't have exemption documents in the state that they need to register in. However, we can help you go through a process of recovering those missing documents so that you would have them. And that sort of makes the tax exposure disappear because if you have a, a document to back up the sale, then it wouldn't have been necessarily taxable. However, if the document is missing, the state would view it as taxable. So the whole the goal of this process is to figure out the breakout of that. Do we have taxable sales in this state that we need to sort of look at before we make a decision in terms of contacting the state in any way? If you do have exposure, if you do have nexus in states that you did not know about, we have a tax advisory department here internally that's going to help us through analyzing these results and helping you figure out how you should proceed in each state individually. Um, if you're in a situation where the state has not contacted you and you have not contacted the state and you do potentially have exposure, you do have options. Um, so there's a program called a voluntary disclosure. Um, that is essentially an amnesty program that allows you to enter the state anonymously 
it guarantees penalty and interest abatement, which is huge because the penalty rate for most states, if you are delinquent, is anywhere from 20 to 50% of the tax due. So it can very, very quickly add up. If you do enter the state through volunteer disclosure, that is guaranteed to be uh, abated. So you do not pay penalties or interest if you enter through voluntary disclosure. Um, it does also limit the look back period in some cases. So if you've had nexus for an extended period of time, if you enter through voluntary disclosure, there are cases where you won't necessarily have to pay the back tax that's due. Um, so it's a very helpful program to incentivize businesses to get into compliance. Um, and so that's something that we can help you determine if it's needed. And if it is needed, it's a process we can help you navigate. Um, now, Nexus is obviously a, a very big conversation in and of itself. And the way I see it is it's sort of the baseline uh, when it comes to a conversation around sales tax. Understanding where you have Nexus is such a critical piece to understand. But then there's a whole different can of worms opened if you are in a situation where maybe you're registered in one or two states right now and it's pretty manageable, but now all of a sudden you've done a risk assessment and you have nexus in 25 states, um, which, by the way, Keith and I were sort of talking about this, and I think that overall as a business, most of the customers that do these risk assessments with us are going to find that they are not in compliance. I think there's something like 80 to 85 percent of the businesses that complete a risk assessment um, do find out that they're not in compliance. So it's, it's a very common thing for businesses to have not kept up with this. But if you do go through this process, you find that you have nexus, you didn't know about it, um, then you're probably thinking, how am I going to handle this? How am I going to keep up with rates in multiple states? How am I going to manage exemption documents for 25 plus states? That is where Avalira's sort of bread and butter comes into play. Um, you know, we are at the end of the day a tax solution. So we are an automation uh, solution that does tie into NetSuite. We tie into Sage. We tie into the majority of e-commerce solutions out there. And what we're able to do is automate sales tax compliance. Um, we're able to keep up with all the rates that you need to manage. We can help you manage your exemption documents, and we can also help to file your sales tax returns. So um, there's a lot that we can do to help. Um, but if you are in a situation where Nexus has never been evaluated, the risk assessment is a really great place to start if you have questions about any of this. Um, that service is typically $4,500. Um, because of this webinar and our partnership with Oasis, we are offering that to any attendee on this webinar um, for 33% off. So the price would be $3,000 flat. Um, and that is going to be valid through November 24th. So the day before Thanksgiving. Um, and Jody is going to be sending out an email after this with um, more information about that as well. Uh, Keith, is there anything that you want to add? all of that uh no i think i'm good i think your number uh 85 to 90 percent of the the clients that actually do the nexus study find something i think it's actually higher I, i'm at about a maybe a 100 percent success rate when it comes to you know clients that i work with that done nexus study have found that they are out of compliance in a lot of states so it's um economic nexus is especially one of those biggest impacts that a lot of businesses are feeling over the past couple of years, um, especially during COVID, is, as you had mentioned before, with e-commerce, it's just been a little crazy out there. Yeah, I will say for me personally, you know, I would say nine times out of 10, the customers I speak with do start this process with a risk assessment. And I have not ever had a customer get a, a risk assessment back that there isn't something on it that they did not know about. Um, and also, please keep in mind, you know, if you do a risk assessment, you're in no way obligated to Avalara on a move forward basis. Um, I always tell people, you know, if you're in a situation where you have questions, at least get into a position where you're knowledgeable about maybe what you're ignoring. Um, I joke about that with customers all the time. You know, it's better to at least know what your situation is and what you're avoiding rather than just having this be this big black cloud hanging over your head where you're kind of thinking we're not in compliance, so we don't really know how to start. So this is a great way to kind of just see where you stand today um, and what it would take to figure out, um, you know, getting into full compliance. And that's something that we can help you navigate. Um, so, you know, I think with that, we, we're about ready to wrap up unless there's any more questions, which I think I just Alex? saw one. Alex, we did yes. have a question that came in via the chat. 
um, and it's regarding the cost for the um, risk assessment. Is the $3,000 just for the assessment or is the analysis included with that price? Because So can you just it cover that again? Yeah, it's included. So basically the risk assessment starts with the questionnaire where you're gonna fill that out. What you get is a report, which we are gonna send that out to everyone on the call. You're gonna get an example report um, to see what the deliverable looks like when that process is done. Um, and then typically once that report comes back, what we'll do is coordinate a call with one of our internal tax advisors. We'll go through the findings. And then typically what we'll do as a next step is send you some more information to help evaluate the exposure. Um, and then we will have another call with the tax advisor to look at that. What you end with at the end of the process is a formal recommendation for how to move forward with each individual state. And all of that is included for that $3,000, yes. And how do they take advantage of that offer? If you would like to take advantage of that offer, Jody is going to send you an email <laughs> when we hang up um, <laughs> with, please reach out to her. Um, I know, I don't know if this deck is gonna get shared, Solana, um, if the deck gets shared, obviously mine and Keith's information is in there, feel free to reach out to us as well. Um, but the best point of contact, Jody, unless you wanna correct me, would probably be you to start the process. Yes, I am absolutely the best point of contact. I do work with both the Sage and NetSuite teams, so uh, reach out to me directly and I can get you connected with either Keith or Alex, whoever is most appropriate uh, to handle your questions and follow up and uh, get you signed up with a, a risk assessment if that is uh, deemed what should happen. I did put Alex, mine, and Keith's uh, contact information, our email addresses in the chat window, so you can go back through there and, and check that out. Um, my email again is Jody, J O D Y, at oasisky.com. Uh, super simple to reach me. Um, before we wrap up, just checking to see, I don't see any other questions. Solana, did I miss anything? You did not miss anything, um, Alex and Jody. I think you both addressed this, but there will be a follow up that goes out that will have the slide deck, a link to the um, webinar recording, and I do believe a bonus asset will be um, in that as well. So, yes, you'll receive that, and Jody will be your point of contact. So, I'm just thinking I'm reiterating everything that you all already said. Okay, and the one thing that I did miss was introducing Solana Callahan, our wonderful marketing manager who made this presentation and uh, discussion possible. Thank you so much, Solana, for organizing everything and, and gathering up the troops. So uh, without further ado, I think we can wrap it up and please reach out directly if you have any other questions. Thanks. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much, yeah. everybody.